The expansion of South Africa's nuclear program is key to economic growth, job creation and the move to clean energy. Now that's according to Electricity and Energy Minister Dr. Hossi Nsaramahopa when he gave a keynote address at the second G20 Energy Transition Working Group meeting held in Cape Town. The three-day event sees global stakeholders meeting to collaborate and share knowledge about the role of nuclear energy as the world tries to mitigate the effects of climate change. Ramukhopa says nuclear is going to be a big part of the baseload of energy in South Africa. Now, the Electricity and Energy Minister gave a list of reasons why South Africa should invest in the full nuclear cycle. He says it's important for his department to restore the credibility of the nuclear program in the country. Ramokhopa acknowledged that discussions around upfront capital costs to fund the nuclear program is a challenge and it still needs to be determined where the finances will come from. Well, joining us to further discuss today's G20 Energy Transition Working Group is Minister of Electricity, Dr. Hossi Ense Ramachopa. Minister, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. So, in your address today, Minister, you, among others, reiterated the country's position to expand nuclear power, relying, of course, on pebble bed reactor technology. Just take us through this and other salient points of your address today. Uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, good evening to the viewers at home. Yes, as we all know that uh, nuclear power is a stated policy of South African government. As I speak to you, we've got uh, uh, the only three active reactors uh, on the continent. Um, we have two of them at Quebec that we use for uh, nuclear power. They generate uh, 1,800 megawatts. And we also have a research reactor at uh, Pelindaba, which helps us for medical isotopes. I mean, for the record, we are responsible for 25% of the global supply of uh, medical uh, isotopes. And we also know that uh, we have now extended the life of uh, Quebec unit number one. Uh, the regulators granted, granted us uh, permission to add another 20 years of life. Uh, we are working on unit number two. And uh, we also know that the global trends are pointing to uh, what you call small modular reactors uh, as a future for um, nuclear power uh, because of their agility um, and also because uh, they are modular. Unlike the current fleet of uh, nuclear reactors that relies on uh, pooling um, and also they cannot uh, be mass produced. So it adds a degree of agility. Mm -hmm. The International Energy Association makes the point that uh, we need to uh, double the uh, nuclear capacity in the world to ensure that we are able to meet decarbonization, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And as we know, two major advantages of nuclear. The first one is that it is base load, the most reliable, efficient, uh, and, and it's also a, a clean technology, which is a, a, a second uh, advantage. So we've built this capacity over time. Unfortunately, we abandoned our pebble bed modular reactor, which was the first generation of uh, SMR technology. Uh, the Chinese, the French, and the Americans, the South Koreans, uh, and the Russians have uh, moved uh, far ahead when in fact uh, we are uh, in some instances even ahead of them. Uh, mm -hmm. But we still have an opportunity to uh, collaborate with them and ensure that nuclear power enters um, uh, the energy requirements for the country and we are able to achieve energy security. Mm. Minister, when you speak, pardon me for interjecting there, but when you speak of the positives around this pebble bed reactors, you speak of their agility, I've heard you now, you speak of them being modular, but are they cost competitive? Because any time we've spoken about nuclear energy, we know that the pushback clearly was not predominantly because of who would have been those that collaborate with South Africa, who would be part of the nuclear build program, but more the costs involved. So is this, at least the pebble bed reactor, cost competitive among the positives? Well, firstly, is that uh, we don't have to go beyond our own borders. As I speak to you, we've got uh, the evidence of uh, Quebec, as I've mentioned. Uh, within the fleet of uh, ESCOM, Quebec is the cheapest uh, electricity that we are generating in the country. So over the life uh, cycle of, uh, of uh, the nuclear power plant, it works out to be cheaper. The only um, uh, challenge that we have is the upfront capital cost. So by our own admission that uh, uh, they, they can be uh, very prohibitive, uh, expensive. Uh, uh, nuclear has got a, a notorious record across the globe of uh, uh, going beyond budget and also not uh, being completed uh, within time. 
But what the SMRs does is to ensure that uh, you are able to uh, manage uh, the production of uh, nuclear reactors because they can be mass produced, they can be uh, produced uh, in a factory, provided that you've got all the, the regulatory requirements. So there's a degree of predictability in relation to the costs associated with that. Mm -hmm. But what we also want to design in the program uh, is to ensure that uh, we have a, a fixed cost, uh, uh, if you like, um, a vendor. Uh, so when someone comes into the space, when we go uh, the route of uh, SMR or any form of uh, nuclear technology, it must be a fixed cost so that uh, we don't get to be surprised down the line. What uh, has been the case uh, in major uh, public procurement of uh, um, uh, significant assets, you will find that uh, we are socializing the risks. So where there are risks involved in major projects and not just nuclear, it can be any type of infrastructure project. When there are mishaps, there are cost overruns. Yeah. It's the state that uh, takes uh, um, the care. So essentially it is the, pub, um, and the, 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 the public that uh, carries that responsibility. Mm. And then we have a tendency of uh, privatizing uh, the profits. So when the returns are healthy, it's the private sector that uh, ends that return. So mm. it is important that in the design of your procurement uh, um, uh, program, you are able to ensure that the risk is uh, equitably spread. Uh, the party that uh, has got the, uh, the capacity to manage the risk, uh, uh, that the risk gets to be allocated to that party. So the experiences across the globe uh, shows us that, that uh, it is important that the state must have within its ranks uh, those people who've got a significant amount of uh, a technical knowledge uh, from a a technical engineering point of view and financial engineering point of view so that we are able to protect the interest of the state and the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And these are lessons that uh, we learned from uh, uh, multiple jurisdictions across the globe. And when we had the conversations and the panel discussions uh, this uh, afternoon, those are some of the experiences that were shared with us. But what is not in doubt is that nuclear is going to anchor, if you like, uh, the expansion of um, um, energy um, uh, provision is going to anchor, um, if you like, the industrialization of uh, many parts of the globe. And I think Africa can benefit immensely yeah. out of this uh, technology, given that they've got 600 million people who don't have access to electricity and who've got the ambition of expanding, not just as South Africa, but as a continent. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're foregrounding in these discussions and taking it to the next level. Mm. Now, Minister, you've stressed that a successful transition or energy transition is one that would not leave anyone behind, where it not only serves as a tool for growth, but also a vehicle for social and economic inclusion. But as it stands now, as national government, you may have a clear plan that intends to leave no one behind, but in the regions, in those poor mining communities, those kind of plans are non-existent. Even with multinationals, it seems there isn't necessarily a cogent or comprehensive plan to ensure that nobody is left behind. So how do you, as government, national government, ensure that this transition does include jobs and skills? Um, for the observations uh, on the mark, uh, I do make that uh, admission myself. So what are we doing in response? Uh, I think in the next um, uh, four weeks or so, we will be unveiling the first phase of uh, a, a microgrid project that we are doing in the two villages in Musina. These are the villages that uh, that you never had access uh, to electricity. Uh, so uh, using the latest uh, technologies, we are harnessing our re um, um, uh, renewable energy endowments such as uh, um, the sun uh, in that part of uh, the country. We are pairing a uh, PV with the battery technology that has got the storage capacity of over four hours. Uh, and then we'll be rolling it out in, in that uh, village. We also will be providing street lighting and also more significantly providing uh, internet connection, free Wi-Fi to public services. So essentially addressing the transformative elements of uh, energy supply. Uh, and then the second thing that we'll be addressing in relation to that first phase of uh, our project rollout is the cost of uh, electricity. There are many people who are watching us this evening and um, are having difficulty in uh, 
um, absorbing uh, the tariff increases, uh, affording the cost of electricity. So it is important that, that we are able to address the runaway tariff increases related to uh, electricity. And that's the biggest threat that is now confronting us. I mean, just to give you a sense, over the past 10 years, uh, the electricity prices have increased uh, on average 600%. And we know that our salaries are not able to keep up uh, with that. Uh, so we, you can see that our people are poorer and also we are beginning to see new dimensions of energy poverty. By new dimension, I mean the following. It doesn't necessarily follow that people uh, are not connected to the ESCOM grid, but they are connected, uh, but they just can't afford it. So this solution that we are introducing as a first phase is to ensure that we address uh, uh, three things, uh, the speed of connectivity and the cost associated with that. The second thing is that uh, the electricity must be affordable because uh, the sun is the sun. Uh, so it's not like um, some of your energy sources such as uh, uh, diesel, such as uh, um, uh, coal that uh, is uh, sometimes uh, a function of uh, market forces. So the sun is the sun. As long as the quality of the radiation remains the same and there's no reason for us to doubt this. Of course, climate change can introduce new dimensions. Yeah. But the, the evidence we have is that the, the sun remains the sun. Though. So there's some degree of uh, predictability with regards to the cost of generation. But what we also know is that the, the storage capacity of the batteries, as uh, there's more um, um, research that is done, is going to be extended. I mean, when I was in China recently, I met an entity that claims that their batteries uh, uh, can store up to eight hours. Uh, so we are moving from the current four hours to eight hours, and I want to suggest that um, that those improvements will continue. So you will see that the combination of solar and PV will approximate base load conditions. And then the third element of this uh, solution is that these cleaner forms of uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, meaning that we are able to keep up to our nationally determined contributions, our obligations to the environment. Having said all of the above, coal will remain part of the energy mix. Having said all of the above, nuclear will remain part of the energy mix. Hydro will be part of the energy mix. And now we're working on gas to power solution. So the point I'm making, Kundo, is that uh, it's not a binary conversation. It's not either or. Uh, there are forces uh, in the public domain who want to suggest that it's one form of uh, energy solution over the other. Our mm -hmm. argument is that uh, it's, um, it's the aggregate. So it's a function, it's a question of additionality. So adding more renewables whilst keeping and maintaining uh, your base load. So oh, we know right. that uh, there are risks associated with the uh, intermittable nature of renewables. They are not undispatchable. They don't have uh, the kind of inertia that is required. They are unable to protect the frequency um, when there are significant oscillations in relation to uh, the quality of that uh, renewable energy. Mm. And it can expose the grid and the grid might collapse. We're yeah. still waiting for what were the causes in Spain and Portugal with regards to the latest grids uh, coll uh, collapse. But I think we are not too far off to suggest that it could be, amongst others, uh, the highest uh, penetration of renewables. So you have to do all of the above and uh, protect the grid. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying that the nuclear, coal, hydro, solar, wind, all of these things, the gas to power, are going to constitute the mix going into the future. And mm -hmm. in this way, we'll be able to protect our national interest, which is energy sovereignty. All right, Minister. So in essence, no reductions. In fact, what we're going to see is additions to the energy mix. Thank you very much for your time. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. That's Minister of Electricity and Energy, Dr. Josiense Ramachopo.